The teenage years can be awkward, squeaking voices, raging hormones, but imagine your delicate years into puberty also come with apocalyptic consequences if you don't stay pure until marriage. My next guest was raised Jehovah's Witness since he was three when his teenage parents converted. His comically awkward adolescence led him to writing a book, which became the film Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk. Today, he's going to share the extreme side of purity culture and the hilarious, messed up, and beautiful things that came from it. Author, screenwriter, lover of real paper, cafes, and ska, Tony Duchesne. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, thank you. <laughs> what a beautiful intro. How did I get lover of ska? What happened there? What, what Did I do something? You said that randomly in an interview, and I was like, oh. ska. So do you still like ska? Yeah, it, but it, I, when I was younger, it changed my life because the, the specials and all these bands, they wore suits and ties, and I had to wear a suit and tie all my life as a dork, preaching door to door to all my you know school friends. And I was like, wait a second, I could just wear a suit and tie and be cool. So then I used that, and I wore a suit and tie all the time, and I was like, no, I'm in the ska. And then they're like, oh, there's the ska guy, even though I had a Bible in my hand. So That's clever. Did you listen to Christian ska, any Five Iron Frenzy? Oh no, I'm I so like we weren't supposed to listen to Christian music because Chris, other Christians were demonized. Um but we were allowed to listen to certain, you know, clean music and um but I hid a lot of my music taste from my parents. I just I felt bad for listening to great music, but at the same time it spoke to me in a weird way. So That's so interesting that like the the Christian music that was talking about God, that was that was not good. But secular music. Because it's the wrong God. (laughs) Right. Apparently, which is so interesting. I've learned so much about Jehovah's Witness since preparing for this interview and the the, the whole purity culture part of it. um, You know, I relate to coming up Pentecostal, but. I think a lot of my listeners have also come up, even if they're more secular, with the abstinence-only kind of sex education approach. So I'm curious about (laughs) your coming up that way. Did you ever get like the talk? What did that look like? I like how you said coming up that way (laughs) after sexual. Um, (laughs) Did I ever get the talk? Do you mean the talk about how I was supposed to stay a virgin until I was married? Well, I was thinking more of like where babies come from, but sure. Uh, you know, you kind of, yeah, I had to learn that on my own, uh, where babies come from. But at the same time, it's just, a, I mean, it's drilled in. So here's the Jehovah's Witnesses. They just, they bring up sex and fornication constantly. Ever since I was like three years old, I knew that sex was bad. Fornication was bad. Nothing before marriage. So it's three times a week this is being drilled into us to the point where it's just like, Mom, Dad, what's fornication? I don't even know what it is until I'm, um, you know, I don't even know how to do a fornication, but they're telling me not to do it for so long. So the um, the abstinence thing is just a given. If you do that, you're going to die at Armageddon, like the rest of the heathens who are listening to Christian ska. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's really interesting because what you're talking about isn't like an abstinence approach. It's almost like a, a stronger prohibition approach where, you know, don't touch this and you don't even know what this is. Right. And then even later on, so, um, and I'll just give a brief, you know, there's a quick overview of tragedy in my family where my uncle killed himself. My dad had a nervous breakdown. My sister attempted suicide and they were trying to figure out what the sin in our family was. And I had touched boobs and a vagina. Uh, So I went and confessed and they were like, oh, that's why Jehovah took his Holy Spirit from your family and your uncle killed himself and all these things happened was because I touched boobs and a vagina. So that like made it all clear to them. And they're like, oh, now we get the problem. Dude, that so is... that's so it's kind of like that much weight and responsibility is put upon uh, what they call immorality. So and that has obviously a huge mental health impact and on your family and then. Is your family still in the Jehovah's Witness? A lot of them are, and my parents aren't. And I could, yeah, but speaking of mental health, do you want me to get my pills? Yeah, get your pills. And show you. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it impacts you for the rest of your life. And I think what I've been learning as a human is like what impacts me, I just have to learn how to use it for what I enjoy. So, you know, like writing, I got, I got to write something that was, 
terrible about terrible awkwardness and that's kind of what's cool about it is it's the human condition so it's relatable and here's my little angle on it and um it's if i have to find constructive ways that go wait a second yeah that's really weird and stupid but let's make it a story and a lot of stories are really stupid out there so why not engage in my stupid story and make it a thing exactly well you were um, I th- think in another interview or maybe on your own podcast, you talked about that co- sort of engagement was kind of your gift. You were able to kind of like close the deal on getting people to sign up to do Bible studies with you easier and more effectively than other people in your group. I was really good at it. Yeah, I, I, I would I would almost do it. Well, as I was like having doubts, I didn't want to study with anyone and bring them into the Jehovah's Witnesses. But I could set up a Bible study within five minutes and close the deal. And then I would never contact the person again because there's this weird rule in the Jehovah's Witnesses where they're like, well, if people are ignorant of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll make it through Armageddon. And I'm like, well, let them all be ignorant. Why are we telling them all? What, uh, why would we do that to them? So that was my weird angle on it. And then, but at the same time, what, so I did practice being a slut for about, you know, six months after I was divorced, you know? And at the same time, I could close a deal with a lady in about five minutes. It was <laughs> it turned it turned into this situation where just like wow, I could get from uh yeah, these drinks are fine to naked in 20 minutes. And I'm like, okay, this is this is power, but I don't like using this power. It feels really weird. And then my also my problem is if I'm naked with someone, I feel like I'm in a relationship with them, and they're like, No, no, I just want to use you for what you have. And I'm like, but don't you want to go antiquing tomorrow? And they're like, get out of my house. <laughs> so I mean, I but is that a problem it, though? I think that's really sweet, you know, that I, I'm that way too. I'm relationship oriented. Yeah, it was it was good. It was good to go there and go, oh, okay, this this isn't really for me. You know, and I'm a, I'm friends with almost every woman I had a one night stand with now. For years after. I even forget I had one night stands with them. People remind me and I'm all, oh, that's right, we've had sex, but uh, you know, now we're just buds and I roll better that way, I guess. And I want I'm um, this, the monogamous dude who went ahead and sowed some oats and got out of the sowing oats and was like, I don't know about oats. I think I want bran. <laughs> so do you think that that part of you came from your upbringing of being Jehovah's Witness and having that more traditional um, a framework for relationships or is that just something you think is innate inside of you and would have been there regardless of your upbringing? I don't know. I feel a little of both. I've, I've over the years, I've gotten into tarot and numerology and other things like that. And from what I've understood about myself and doing like the numbers on my name and date or whatever, I'm very family oriented and I'm like kind of, I have this weird family leadership tribe orienting thing that I need. And so I've come to understand I am a person who needs family in my life and I create that family around me. And I've been trying and I've been doing that for years without knowing it. And one of my dear friends who taught a numerology class to me, he's, he told me, he's just like, dude, this is, this is you. This just tells the story of you beyond belief because you're the guy that brings people together and you crave, uh, I crave a tribe. And the Jehovah's Witnesses satisfied that craving, but under very strict regulations. So is it the Jehovah's Witnesses? Is it me? I don't know. It's probably a little of both. And it was, uh, um, I think I would have been the same without the Jehovah's Witnesses in a way. I might have been even more conservative um, because after, you know, after I left, I was like, woohoo, everyone does drugs and orgies, right? And it's just like, so where do, where do I put my keys? How, who do I have sex with? And they, no one showed up and I'm all... Oh, that's not how it works. Oh, people have morals. What? So. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Because um, the the prohibition part of the purity culture that you were around would have made it seem like there are dire consequences if you leave this tribe. Which I w- wanted to ask you. You know, you married a Jehovah's Witness girl. It didn't work out. Y'all got divorced. And so you experienced all this freedom, freedom from monogamy, freedom, free, freedom from dancing around the rules and pretending to follow them or whatever. Were Other than the unsuccessful one night stands, were there any other areas, um, I guess in the area of related to the purity culture where you kind of like went off the rails and realized, oh, that's maybe not for me, or maybe it is for me. 
Well, let me tell you, the one night stands were successful. I just, <laughs> I, you know, on, on the uh, sexual part of it, they were successful. On the, um, on the, oh, is this life for me? That's not successful. Yeah. Um, no, you know, I've been, I was the anomaly in the Jehovah's Witnesses because I didn't care about um, what they were talking about. I was like, no sex, no drugs, you know, and whatever. And I'm just like, yeah, cool. I like films and I like music and I like books. I was just so into the, the storytelling and I didn't, I didn't even realize why. And I, re I realized as I get older, oh, I was really into mythology. I'm into the continued creation of mythology of how we tell our stories to other people. And that gets me off beyond belief. And so they can't do nothing to you for that. They're like, oh, you like art? <laughs> oh. You know, it's just like, well, it better be clean art. And I'm like, yeah, you guys don't even know what books. You don't even know the authors I'm reading. It doesn't matter to you. Mm. You don't get it. You know, so they're like, as long as you're not reading demonized Stephen King. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I'm reading worse occult than that. But you wouldn't even know the names. So I'm getting by. That's so interesting. <laughs> I, I love what you're saying about the storytelling part. I, I really enjoyed the relatability of how you told, how the story was told in the, the movie that was made from your, your book. And I think just my favorite part was when you were preaching with the other girl that you had a crush on and um, tell our listeners about that because that was just the, so tender and it's so heartbreaking and so um, relatable for people who, grow up, whether in Jehovah's Witness or whatever else, that is kind of putting an overemphasis on this quote unquote purity culture. Yeah, uh, that's where, I mean, that short story was the beginning of Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk. And it was about a very real experience with, uh, we call them brothers, we're brothers and sisters in the Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'll just use their lingo. It was, an, it was my experience with this sister that I didn't even realize I loved, that I was totally in love with. And it, it came out in therapy in my 30s that I loved her. It's it, My therapist, <clears throat> that's another story, because you know how you're supposed to work through all your anger issues and stuff? Yeah, I had to work through falling in love, too. Aww. And I was like, and my therapist is like, yeah, all feelings aren't bad, Tony. You know, these things come up. <laughs> it's, it, get on board. But um, there was this one sister that I didn't realize how much of a... Um, vibration I had with her and I and I would go preaching and to just sit in the because we have to get into cars and we you know they we the, not a lot of people had cars because we were all there's a lot of us underage so we get smashed in the back seat of a car together and I would just be next to her with my leg next to hers and it would mean everything to me and that five minutes driving to the territory where we we're going to preach and I was going to humiliate myself in front of other people from school and stuff if I sat with her, it made it all worth it. And I would just be like, it would make it worth it for a couple of days, you know, and I would call her later and be like, so preaching about Jehovah's pretty cool today, huh? And she'd be like, yeah, it was cool. Like, the, you know, we talked about Jesus and stuff. I'd be like, oh, I know, didn't we? But um, <laughs> it's just, but that was the beginning of, that was the first time I wrote anything and put it out there that I grew up a Jehovah's Witness. That was kind of the the opening for me, you know, 15 years out or not 15 years, maybe more like, five years after I put the, the stamp on it and said, I'm out. And my wife at the time was like, don't tell anybody, please. And I'm like, yeah, it's not like I'm going to do anything different. I'm just not showing up anymore. But um, <laughs> I'm not going to make a film or anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so does the girl know that she's in the movie? Have, have you talked with her or kept in touch with her at all? So, um, so I've, I've heard, no, because they're Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, uh, right. So nobody, no, a lot of it's, so you know, a lot of those those characters ended up being composites of other things. It was so the you know the original story was her, it was it was the me and her story, and then um and then I did get in touch with her though, because uh, she and I was still married, and she was married, and I just said, hey, I gotta ask you a couple questions. You know, this happened and this happened, and I'm and I and this came up in therapy, and so we were we just talked. No, and I and she was like, "Yeah, I was totally in love with you. I didn't Aww. know that you loved me back." And I was like, "Oh my god, if you just weren't awful to me, I would have been." You know, there was there was just this constant. It just I, the magnetism. I re, I figured it out in my thirties, and we got to talk about it, which was great. It, it was nobody I should have ever ended up with in my life, so I'm not. It wasn't like a disappointment, but it was cool to go. 
wow, that really did happen between 13 and 17. And okay, that makes sense. And I, it was nice to both acknowledge it and just go, cool. And we're, you know, the worst people for each other we would ever be. And so, but it's nice to know that it was good, that, that, it, that it was actually real for both of us then when we were young. That's so sweet. And so you ended up marrying um, another person from the church when you were 25. And then you, as you said, you were like, hey, I'm not doing this anymore. And it, it didn't work out. Is that why it didn't work out? It, well, um, in the end, I believe it didn't work out from the beginning because it was a Jehovah's Witness marriage which is very different than actual relationships, which I found out later. How? Um, it's You get thrown together, and then the, the promise, everything's about you're going to live forever on Paradise Earth, and you're going to become perfect. So even if you have a crappy husband or wife, this crappy husband or wife will become the perfect husband or wife when we get through Armageddon. So it's everything's just like stay in your suffering, it's all going to be okay. It's going to work out. And, um, and that's kind of the belief system. And I didn't even know I still had it. Like, I think we were like four years into our marriage when I told her I can't go. And she was like, please come. And I'm like, no, <laughs> but <clears throat> she's like, well, then don't tell anyone. I'm like, all right. And then nine years later we got divorced, but, um, but I was still, I didn't know that I was still under the belief system, even to the nine years, even when we got divorced, I was like, it didn't even dawn on me that I, that we can get divorced because I still had that belief system totally in my DNA. And it was a beautiful thing. She initiated the divorce, which is a you know whole nother story in the Jehovah's witnesses, but I'm so grateful for it. It was just like, Oh wow. Thank you for taking action because I didn't even realize action needed to be taken. That's yeah. Do you have anything that was a tradition from that religion that you kind of still keep in some sort of way or some version of it? Not really. Um, I what, what I did, I did something when I was uh, 20 years old after the elder said, Oh, so you touched boobies in a vagina. Of course your uncle killed himself and your dad had a nervous breakdown because of what you did. Young, disgusting man. Um, after that meeting, I left and I freaked out and I, I joined a college radio station and I just started taking radio classes. <clears throat> so I substituted my three nights a week going to the kingdom hall, three nights a week going to production studio and just that kind of became, I had to do something with that time. And that was one of the perfect things for me to do with that time. Cause I'm such a radio guy. <clears throat> I didn't even know you could just take radio classes. I'm like, what? You just sign up and then you be, can get a, air slot after you, you know, uh, after you do time and demo tapes, all you gotta do is demo tapes. I, there was no, so that's what I, I, I got, I got suckered back into the Jehovah's Witnesses after that. And they told me to quit the college radio station mm -hmm. and I did, but that, I think that was the ritual. Me to think more down the road. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, we, we, the, recording froze just a little bit. So you're saying that being in another, basically you got a new tribe of people and you were able to express your storytelling and that helped you um, begin to deconstruct some of the harmful yeah. things. Yeah. And it was KFJC 89.7 FM, Los Altos Hills. And I'm still friends with most of the people that uh, from the, the class of 1990 DJing years, um, and they mean everything to me. And that radio station means everything to me still. And I talked to them and we were all going through so much turmoil in our own lives on so many different levels. So it wasn't just me. I find out what my friends, I never knew what they were going through. And they're just like, oh, if I didn't go there, I would have killed myself because this and this and this was happening. And I found my weirdos at KFJC. And I'm all, ah, life is just about finding your weirdos. Now I get it. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Can we please make that a t-shirt or something? Life is about finding your weirdos. That's the best quote ever. As oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make a t-shirt. Yeah, definitely. Go to, go to life is about, well, well, I forgot what I said. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guess what? It's recorded, so we're good. Okay, um, cool. So as we wrap up, I have two questions for you. One is, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, if, if someone is listening to this and let's say they are kind of 
working, they're at like where you were at, at the radio station, kind of dazed and confused coming out of this ideology and uh, unpeeling, peeling back the layers of maybe the bad things that are a result of their experience with purity culture. Um, what would you, what advice would you give them if y'all were sitting together and, and having a beer at the end of the day? I would, I mean, I would just, I, I, I would want them to have their own, their, their own path. You know, I mean, I may, I may suggest like some, what, what interests me. And I probably talk to them and go, Hey, what interests you in life? And that's about it. I don't, I don't want to get in the way of how they maybe need to stay or maybe need to leave. Um, I, I have found so much, I found so much more uh, power in the power of kindness that people showed me when they went, <clears throat> when they said, Oh, you have that belief system. Okay. Don't worry about it. And the, my persecution complex didn't kick in. And I was just like, wait, people aren't trying to block me from this. So I would, I guess I wouldn't give them too much advice because I want them to do what they need to do. And I would just tell them what's kind of been fun to me. And I'd be like, so what's fun in your life? And cool. that uh, explore that a little more. Um, I don't want to. I, I don't want to push it the other way and go. You need to go out there and have some sex. And I'm talking three times a week. It's just like <laughs> no. You you might. It might not work for you that way. And it's okay. Just, just, just continue to get to know yourself. And I mean, you know, I'm 51 now. I still don't know who the hell I am. I'm continuing to learn. So if, you know, someone's my age at 19 or whatever. Good for you. Let's just keep on learning. That's all I got. I I have no definitive answers. I but, probably shouldn't be listened to at all. <laughs> I actually kind of like that answer because it's like the unprescription. It's about empowering the person to figure it out on their own, but supporting them through that process. So actually, I really, I really dig that. My last question is, if you had a teenage son um, or a teenage daughter, how d- would you imagine that the talk going or your, you know, the issues and conversations around sex and sexuality. Oh, so if they, you know, if they're like, Hey dad, so what is it? What, what, what do I do when I see a girl naked? Yeah. Like that kind of question. Yeah, those, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, God, I'm not in that situation. I don't know. I think, um, I think a lot of it is just not, not making them feel ashamed. Uh, you, you don't want to make kids feel ashamed. So if they have questions, just be really open. And I think, you know, kids are smart. They're intuitive and they come up with those questions and you got to answer them truthfully. If you're, if you skirt around any issues, kids know that you're BSing them. And, and I mean, I grew up going, wait a second, you're BSing me. And I would dig into the truth and it would, you know, there were times when I would almost make my mom have a nervous breakdown, but I needed to know the truth. I couldn't have this little gloss over of what's going on. So I think, um, it's really funny. Okay. Thinking about it a little more. I think the kids lead the conversation more than the parents. I think the, I think the kids will bring it up more than the parents and you just go, yeah, what do you need to know, man? This worked for me. This didn't work for me. Um, you know, but it's, it's all about respect and, you know, mutual love. And I guess that's where I would come from is just, you know, be respect and love and go with, go with your heart because your heart's going to hurt so bad. And that's when it's awesome. Cause then, you know, you doubt you're doing it right. Seriously. That is the most beautiful thing ever. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. That's, I really like that a lot. I'm so glad that you could share your story and I would love for you to tell the listeners and the viewers where they can see your film and uh, certainly your podcast, anything else that you want to put out there for them to follow up on. Yeah, I think Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk is on Amazon Prime, a couple other places. I don't know what it is outside the United States. Um, and I, I do my podcast drinks with Tony every week. And I, I'm doing this little new thing called the XJW show on YouTube. And I don't know if it's uh, the right thing to do or not, but I just finished episode four. So, Well, that's exciting. Something, sometimes things are just an experiment, and those are the best things. They don't necessarily have to be like a formula. So. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Great job. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, this is fantastic. I appreciate it. Hey, you're still here. That's awesome. I hope to see you next week too. 
I talk with the most interesting people that you've probably never heard of. Most of them are paradoxical and bring an opportunity for you to grow as a person. So if you like bright, meaningful entertainment, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications.